Good morning. Thank you for joining our second webinar in our three-part eBPF Fall Webinar Series. This webinar, BPF Hardware Offload Deep Dive, will focus on the internals of the kernel architecture of the offload and how it allows seamless execution of unmodified eBPF data paths in the hardware. This webinar, copies of the presentations, archived replays of the webinars in this series, as well as any project code, can all be found on our eBPF page in the technology section of netronome.com. The final webinar in our series, eBPF, Tooling and Debugging Infrastructure, on Tuesday, October 9th, will cover common issues faced with eBPF and techniques to diagnose them. If you haven't registered for this webinar, please do. Space is limited. Jakob Kaczynski is a long-term Linux kernel contributor who has been leading the kernel team at Netronome for the last two years. Jakob's major contributions include creation of BPF hardware offload mechanisms in the kernel and BPF tool user space utility, as well as work on the Linux kernel side of Open vSwitch offload. Today, Kubo will explain the internals of the kernel architecture of the offload and how it allows seamless execution of unmodified eBPF data paths in hardware. At the conclusion of this webinar, we will have a QA session as well as answer some common questions. Please feel free to post questions in the QA section of the Zoom interface. Netronome recently launched a new support site that contains a knowledge base, forums, feature requests, and solutions. Please visit help.netronome.com for more information. Lastly, we will have the drawing for an Amazon gift card at the conclusion of this webinar. Thank you. Now over to Kuba. Thank you um, for the introduction. Uh, let's just jump in. So uh, as far as the agenda is concerned, I will uh, first talk about eBPF and how, uh, why it's an interesting offload target for us. Then I will switch the gear slightly, talk about the hardware and, and, and how it actually works. And then at the end, I will talk about the uh, the kernel internals and, and how it's implemented in the Linux kernel. Um, so starting with the, the BPF uh, sort of high level overview and why, why BPF offload is interesting for us um, and why BPF offload is, is even possible. So um, the thing to understand about the BPF, it's, it has been designed inside the Linux kernel to make um, translation into machine code very easy. So the BPF intermediate representation, which is loaded into the kernel, um, as its goal has the, the ability to for the in-kernel JITs to, to be able to, to generate machine code relatively easily, which makes in which in turn makes it easy to for us to translate into NFP machine code. Um, the eBPF virtual machine, the execution in environment within the Linux kernel is fairly simple and, and very very well understood. There is there isn't that much stuff that the the BPF um, uh, BPF programs can do. The, everything, every uh, interaction of the execution environment is very well defined um, and uh, uh, and uh, very restricted by and, and restricted by the BPF verifier, which which runs on the programs when they are loaded. Um, the, the what is important to understand about the BPF infrastructure inside the kernel is that it has been designed as, as a mechanism uh, to to perform. Um, network processing or, or event processing within the Linux kernel, but, but it is a mechanism and, and not a product in itself. So, so it has been designed by the Linux kernel architects and Linux kernel APIs are, are created for people to be able to, uh, to build their business logic and their, pro, uh, their, their projects on top of and, and are not really projects in themselves. So um, the, there's a big emphasis in, in the BPF uh, ecosystem and, and the internal implementation of it in the kernel to make sure that the, the internal implementation details are of, of the kernel kernel execution environment are never leaked into the BPF um, execution uh, system because uh, it, that would uh, block any changes from, from being made to the Linux kernel. If, if uh, the implementation details uh, leak into the BPF environment, uh, people may start depending on them and then changes to the kernel would in turn break people's application, which is which is not allowed in Linux kernel. Linux kernel has to maintain backwards compatibility with all the applications that, that are working uh, working on it today. So, so the, there is a the very clear, clear, clearly defined API, and, and it is very 
very strictly um, separated from the internals of the implementation. And, and the applications that people build on top of that are only taking advantage of what the API is, is uh, exposing there. Therefore, um, uh, we are sort of uh, creating a BPF execution environment. We are independent of all the uh, application logic and the business logic that is built on top of the mechanism. So the, as, far, as long as the, the BP, we provide a, a capable BPF execution environment in our hardware, there is no real need for us to, to go and help our, our, uh, our customers or our users to uh, port their application. There is no porting requirement required for, for us. The, the, the application will just run and just the execution environment is different. And obviously, BPF is extensible, so we can um, uh, make use of our special hardware features either through, um, through performing the appropriate uh, optimization steps during translation of the program or through uh, a spe uh, a specialized implementation of the BPF hardware. Um, and obviously, uh, it is important uh, to, to, to remember and, and to, to stay on top of the newest technologies. And, and BPF is really something that has been growing rapidly in, inside the Linux kernel. There is a lot of um, innovation and, and interesting, uh, interesting uh, developments going on all the time. Um, small changes and, and extensions and, and features being added to all the parts of the BPF ecosystem. Um, and I, I haven't mentioned the many here, but I think the AFXDP uh, one which was added recently, which allows uh, zero copy transmission and, and, and uh, rece reception of packets in user space is a very important development for us. Um, so by providing the BPF execution environment in our cards and, and providing BPF offload, we are, um, we are uh, taking advantage of all of those um, sort of by being compatible with the Linux kernel, we, we can take advantage of all of those developments and all of the innovation that is happening in the BPF ecosystem in the Linux kernel. Um, so um, to establish sort of an understanding of how we look at the BPF, BPF uh, projects, BPF uh, applications today, that there's usually four, uh, three elements that, that, that uh, each uh, application is built of. Obviously, the, the yellow part, the user space, is the most important for, for people who are creating the projects this is your control space, uh, control plane. There's the, this is all the tooling that is required to generate the BPF programs, all the um, all the high level instrumentation. This is what implements the policies and what what the user should be user of a BPF based product should be really interacting with. This is the application. This is the actual application. And below that we have the the, the kernel mechanisms. And in the blue we have the the code that is is running inside the Linux kernel and in in green. Um, are the maps so so the uh, so the data and and programs uh, and the code are can really be divided into the program that's actually loaded and the and the helpers that the Linux kernel will provide to perform um, advanced actions or, or things which cannot be done with, with, from the program itself directly and on the map side we also have this sort of um, split between uh, into two different types the first are the data storage maps which really are um, just for storing information in arbitrary, arbitrary information that the user wants to keep with their programs or communicate between the programs or between the programs and user space. This will be your policies um, and your lookup tables, all, all sort of things. Um, and uh, the, these are the, the data storage maps generally are differ by, by the algorithm that is used for, for lookups, updates, and basically the, the algorithm. Um, uh, and yes, yeah, so, so the array maps, uh, longest prefix match maps, hash maps are just some of them. And they also have a, a global version and a per CPU version for, for better concurrency. And then the second type of maps is uh, what I call here anchor maps. I'm not really sure this is the, the best way to describe them, but they, they are um, sort of control plane maps, which are used for um, uh, accessing uh, Linux kernel objects from BPF programs. Um, and by device maps, for instance, I mean, um, uh, network device maps. So uh, if user wants to perform an operation, uh, fast, uh, quickly perform an operation on, on a networking device or send a packet to a networking device, they have to take this uh, somehow find the networking device. And because the BPF programs are working in the data path, this lookup must be very fast. So what is done is the device reference is obtained by the user space control application. 
and then it is placed in the in the anchor map from where, where it can be uh, retrieved very very efficiently and also that uh, that helps with uh, the life cycle management sort of and, and error handling if the device uh, pointer is is placed in a map and uh, the reference is taken sort of in the control plane and then the data plane just can just use it uh, the, the other map which I have uh, mentioned in this category is, for instance, a perf event map, which allows users to uh, BPF programs to output um, output samples uh, through the perf subsystem, uh, output samples through to a perf ring, which then can be read from user space or a socket map, which is involved in, in, in this socket processing and attaching BPF programs to sockets, etc. Um, so uh, the, the, we will, uh, as we go into the translation and, and the offload, uh, we will handle the, the storage maps and the anchor maps differently. Obviously, the storage maps are translated into standard, uh, similar, or, or exactly the same structures on the device. For storing user, user device, defined information, uh, they're translated basically one-to-one -to, -one to something that's stored in the, the in device memories, but the anchor maps will generally translate into something that looks um, quite different because obviously the constructs, uh, for instance, the construct of a device Will look quite different on on a, in a hardware context than it will uh, in the in the kernel uh, or a perf, perf event map, for instance, will also uh, is sort of uh, implemented differently because the event is not output to an actual perf event buffer on the card; it has to be transported into the kernel. So there is a difference implementation difference between those two um, types of maps for sure um, when when it comes to offload. Um, so. Looking at this environment, how it maps to to a, how has the, how does one uh, go from from this kernel sort of high level um, uh, view of of the uh, BPF elements uh, to 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 go into an execution environment on 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 a different CPU? So the first thing we have to do, obviously, with the programs, is we have to translate the eBPF intermediate representation that is loaded from user space into the uh, native machine code of the device. Um, and while we're doing that, we'll obviously try to do all the optimization, optimizations possible, take advantage of the device instructions, the full instruction set of the device, make sure we schedule the, the instructions appropriately, and, and we try to optimize the I.O. by um, prefetching information and, and, and to copying high, uh, bigger, bigger chunks of, of, of data at the same time. Uh, all that stuff is, is done. When the pro after the program is loaded from user space uh, and, and the optimizations are run inside the, the, the code generator, inside the, the compiler, that's part of the driver, some driver. Um, and obviously, apart from translating the user code, we also have to provide the helper implementation, uh, helper, the, the, the BPF helper that the kernel provides. We have to have some, uh, some implementation of that, the same functionality basically on the card. Um, and this is either provided by, uh, by, by the compiler inside the driver will generate appropriate code and load it dynamically, or the firmware may provide an implementation of the helper to, to just uh, to, to just call uh, directly on the data path. Um, uh, for the maps, we, uh, we will translate, uh, basically the, the maps are, are implemented in the firmware. They will have some form, uh, some, some appropriate for the hardware format. So, they will have the same functionality, but they might, uh, the, the obviously the, the, the hashing function or, or sort, of, sort of thing might differ because uh, when we translate to, thing to a different uh, CPU architecture and different chip architecture, we will want to make use of the memory architecture, make sure that we can take advantage of all the hardware primitives there are for making uh, things like lookups um, efficient. And obviously being a networking chip, we have a lot of the hardware that that can uh, enable uh, efficient lookup and, and memory operations. And, and once we have the programs and the data structures present on the device, we can do all the standard BPF processing directly in the NIC. We can filter the packets. We can do any sort of switching and routing. We are working on being able to do switching and routing to SROV and uh, hopefully at some point also switching and routing between containers so when the packet is ingressing to the system to be able to direct uh, to a container that's work in progress. Um, and we will also enable, obviously, application-specific um, uh, processing in the NIC, be it uh, any sort of encapsulation, decapsulation, packet mangling, and then mm, sending the packet to an appropriate queue on the CPU where the application is expecting a given type of flow. 
Um, so all those things become possible when, when the program is running in the NIC, and uh, especially the uh, directing the packets to an appropriate CPU, that's that's something that's not really possible once the packet is already in the CPU memory, obviously. So that's a unique feature that we can provide by executing the, 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 the code earlier in the processing path of, of the system. Um, quick look on, on the on the hardware that we're talking about here, so we know kind of what, what the device is. Um, these are standard networking cards. Um, the, the net, the, I will now go into the uh, sort of a quick overview of the hardware architecture so so we know how this is possible and, and how we map and uh, onto our hardware exactly for people who are interested but these are um, uh, this sort of uh, ASIC that I will describe now is is a is uh, standard is placed in the standard NIC and, and can be used in, in standard um, uh, servers um, so um, the chip itself uh, is a uh, is a high performance uh, networking ASIC uh, which can connect to the PCIe and, and various types of networking ports, and uh, it has a high high performance uh, interconnect between the elements, and then it has a um, whole bunch of processing cores, uh, memory engines for doing the memory operations, and various hardware accelerators, and all those things can be used together for for packet processing. Um, uh, this is a, a, a more detailed slide about the how the how the chip are, looks internally. On the left, uh, in the top left corner. Uh, and the bottom left corner, there are two uh, instances on the chip of uh, a, so a networking block, which performs all the very basic uh, network processing functions. Uh, it will check the checksums when packets arrive. It will do some packet, some header parsing, describe the packet will, it will in, in a simple way. So the later processing knows whether it's an, whether it's an IP packet, whether it's a uh, whether it's a TCP packet, uh, whether it has VLANs, whether it has MPLS tag, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the sort of basics of network processing will be done in, in this uh, network processing block, as we call it. Uh, and uh, once the pro uh, packets uh, are processed by that, they will be sent to the rest of the, of the, of the chip for sort of the advanced, more advanced processing. Um, uh, between the network processing core on the left, we have the internal memory unit. And on the on the right top corner is the external memory unit. These are the the, the memory units of the of the of the chip. The internal memory unit uses SRAM, so it is a lot faster, but also uh, has limited um, capacity. And the external memory unit is DRAM backed, so it will have um, up to two gigabytes on the uh, CX line of our cards of of external storage that can be. Uh, used for also the uh, user-defined information that, that needs to be stored and for packet data as well. And then in the middle, uh, the long uh, uh, block is, is flow processing cores. This is where the little risk cores uh, are. These are the, this is really the heart of the chip and all the advanced processing happens in those cores. Um, the, the flow processing cores are optimized for, for network processing. They, they have special instructions and and, uh, and the, this is generally where we do the heavy lifting and all the advanced advanced processing of, of the packets. Um, on the right, in the right, on the right, on the top is the PCIe uh, PCIe uh, island. Uh, we have four PCIe interfaces which can connect either to one, two, or three or four um, servers. Um, and then uh, in the middle, sort of, is the security island with um, cryptographic operations can. And uh, things like uh, uh, encryption and authentication can be can be done uh, using the hardware accelerators in the security island. The, the ARM subsystem is ready for management and bring up of the chip. We don't really use it for for network processing much. And then there's also an interlock and um, uh, look aside interconnect uh, for connecting between various chips, uh, uh, TCAM memories, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Those those are populated on the on the card. And uh, BPF obviously maps um, uh, the BPF programs obviously map to the flow processing cores, and and the BPF uh, BPF maps will be placed in the internal and external memory units. Um, so the important thing to note here is that the BPF programs are really placed on the on the in the heart of the system on the processing cores that are doing all the heavy lifting. We are this is not the uh, sort of look aside architecture where there can be when the fast path is done through some uh, ASIC switching and then the BPF programs can run in sort of control plane look aside uh, uh, architecture. This is really the BPF programs are loaded 
exactly when the main processing of the system happens and, and exactly where, where the chip is doing its heavy lifting. Um, um, I will quickly, quickly go just for a, for a packet flow so, so we understand how it goes. Um, um, the packets arrive in the, in the network processing block and then they are forwarded to, to, to the flow processing cores and to the DRAM. So the main portion of the packet is stored in the DRAM, but the, the uh, sort of header portion of it up to two, uh, two kilobytes of, of, the, of the packet are stored directly in the memory of the flow processing core, so it can be accessed very efficiently. And then the flow processing cores will obviously uh, process the packets. And they can use the security engines for security operations. Um, they can use the look aside, uh, the, the interlock and interconnect to access other chips or, or some advanced accelerators. Um, and once the, the packet processing is done, basically the packet goes out uh, or it can be dropped, but, but if, it, if, it's, uh, if it's forwarded, it can be forwarded either to the network, to the PCIe, it can be forwarded out the same port and came in. There is there's really no restrictions or, or of, on what one can do with the, with the packets. Um, and this is a view, again, you can see that uh, where the BPF programs are mapped, mapped are, is really the heart of the chip and where the processing happens. Um, as a quick overview of how the different parts of the BPF uh, virtual machine sort of maps onto the chip, I uh, will not spend too much time on it, but um, we have uh, 50 BPF uh, flow processing cores um, that, that do, the, uh, do the, uh, the, the packet processing. This is all the, the cores that do the packet processing seen in our current uh, firmware architecture. So uh, the register obviously will go into the general purpose registers of the flow processing cores. The stack is mapped into the local memory, uh, which is a, a CRAM area of, of, of the uh, flow processing cores. And then the uh, bigger uh, pieces of information, the maps and uh, will be mapped into the, the uh, memory unit of the chip, memory units of the chip. Most, uh, most of it will, will end up in a DRAM. Um, most of the global maps will be in DRAM. Um, and I'm going back um, from the from the hardware introduction to to the um, software and, and programming uh, aspects of it. Um, the, uh, quick uh, word on the programming model. Obviously, um, our goal for for BPF offload is to make sure that the programs are are can run, can be offloaded without any any modifications being done to them. So. The standard workflow, standard um, generation of the BPF intermediate representation, the BPF IR, IR should should be uh, sort of intact. All the user space stuff should be intact. So when user wants to create a program um, that that will work on on the national card and uh, work in offload environment, the, all the uh, elements of of the workflow are uh, completely unchanged. So user writes the C program the same as they would write it for the kernel compile it to whatever compiler they prefer, and then load it for the BPF system call. And the, the differences really start after the kernel is done, the verification. The verifi once the verification is performed, the kernel will choose um, uh, based on what the user uh, asked it to, to do, whether to um, load the program into the host CPU or load the program into the, the hardware accelerator, in our case, uh, into the NFP. Um, uh, so, um, going slightly more in de detail about the loading process, the, um, the first thing that the uh, user space loaders um, will generally do before the programs are loaded is obviously creating the maps because um, the map objects have to be available before the program is loaded so that the kind of verifier can access those, and those structures and check their types and then information about the maps when the program is actually being uh, generated or, or verified and then uh, and then uh, uh, the machine code is generated so the first the map com maps come first uh, either the, the the loader can uh, can reuse existing maps so it's possible to when the program is loaded to use maps which already are which already exist in the system and in this way we can make the the map the, be shared between multiple pro bpf programs um, what the user space uh, loaders usually do is uh, either uh, access the, the existing maps through the BPF file system, um, request their, their file descriptor by ID. Each map in the Linux kernel has a unique identifier associated with it. And then there's a, a BPF system call command that can be used to retrieve the, 
the file descriptor from the kernel based on that ID. Uh, obviously, the, if there is a daemon, some form of a daemon running in the user space, um, the daemon may just keep their uh, file descriptors in memory open when it, for, for when installing new programs. But um, if the, the map doesn't exist and the loader wants to create a map, there, there's an um, appropriate BPF system called command called map B, uh, BPF map create, and this command will um, <coughs> will uh, uh, tell the kernel to create a new map and allocate all the memory for it. Uh, and, and below here on the bottom of the slide, I have um, the, the, uh, map, the, the structure which is passed to the kernel where maps are created. Um, obviously, the, the, the most important field of, uh, fields are at the top. The map type is, is one of those types that I mentioned earlier. It will be an array map, uh, a hash map, or it will be one of those special maps like a device map. Or, um, device map or perf event map. Uh, then there's a key size. Generally, the key size uh, can be any size, uh, arbitrary length unless the, the map is an array map. And then it has to be four bytes long uh, because it's used directly as an as a, uh, index into the array. Uh, the value is, is generally uh, the same sort of rules apply. The value is going to either be uh, arbitrary length for the user data storage maps, or it will be a, a fixed length for the special maps. So for device maps, there there will be a, a, the, the the values will will be uh, can only be I think uh, four bytes long. Um, and then we have max entries, the number of uh, of entries that the map will have, the various flags which control where the um, how the map is is created, whether elements are pre-allocated or not, etc. Um, slightly lower, we have the NUMA node for controlling which 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 um, NUMA node the map was created on. If you want to make sure that all the map memory is allocated in a specific CPU. Then we have a map name for giving the map, the map um, some uh, human uh, sort of uh, friendly description or, or name. And the most important things for us uh, when it comes uh, to creating new objects is the map IF index. Um, this is a field which allows the user to designate the map to be created on a, a remote CPU on a device. So when the map is created and this field is set to zero, the, the kernel will just create the map on, on the host CPU. If the user sets this, uh, this field to an index of one of the networking interfaces, the kernel will try to take this map and create it on that specific networking interface in the memory of that networking interface. So it can be used in offloaded programs for that networking interface. Um, very similar story for, for the VPF programs. Um, obviously, the loaders, the user space loaders, have to access the instructions that most generally most commonly, this is uh, the instructions are loaded from an ELF file, uh, from an ELF binary, and then uh, the uh, appropriate ELF relocations are applied. The most common relocation that is done by the loader uh, is um, to replace the map references with the file descriptors. Um, file descriptors retrieved in the previous state, uh, previous stage, um, and then BPF, the ones that the BPF instructions are loaded into memory the BPF program load command will be passed to the kernel for the BPF system call to actually load the program. And again, the, the fields of the structures what, what, what one would expect. We have the type, uh, the pointer to the instructions, uh, and the, the number of them. There is a log for outputting, um, for, for, for if outputting uh, um, debugging information to the user if the verification of the program doesn't go well. Um, there is um, a field for, 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 for flags again, and then there is a name to, to be able to, to give the program some uh, human-friendly name. And again, most importantly to us, there is a, a field which uh, designates the program for offload. Program IF index works exactly the same as for the maps. We set it to um, identifier of the networking interface, and then when a kernel sees the, the, the program being loaded with this field set, it will uh, direct the program instead of the host, the, instead of to the host um, CPU uh, code generation. It will direct it to the code generation for, for the for the, the driver that is sort of um, controlling the, the device uh, of which I have indexed the user passed. Um, when so when users are uh, when you are using a libbpf to to load your programs. Uh, there is an IF index field index and attributes for, for the BPF uh, program load uh, function. So you can just send the, set the IF index there 
our user the samples and the, look at the samples in the kernel, how it's done, and, and then all the objects in that uh, BPF program, uh, BPF file that is loaded, uh, will be created on, for offload automatically. Um, and the one thing you will notice here is that um, I have not uh, talked about any of the APIs, um, any of the APIs uh, relating to, to, to networking yet, because um, uh, once the programs are loaded, really the, the, the APIs used for actually attaching the programs are exactly the same as they would be uh, without offload. Um, so jumping into, into the kernel internals, sort of um, uh, all the, the kernel, um, as you have seen, all the kernel interactions with the BPF subsystem starts with the BPF, the BPF system call, which has a, a number of commands. Um, I will first again look at the maps and, and how map, map uh, offload is handled inside the kernel. Um, the BPF system call will, will be invoked with one of those uh, one of the map commands that I have mentioned uh, here on the slide. Um, and then uh, BPF system call is uh, handled by the core BPF subsystem. And then every ter every time the BPF command is 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 uh, invoked in the kernel, the kernel will check whether the the object on which the command is invoked is offloaded or not. Um, so for for standard operations like uh, getting a file descriptor for a map of a given ID, the, that obviously doesn't matter. But when we actually want to access the map or create a map, the the processing will be uh, redirected to a uh, so uh, to a different part of the BPF subsystem, uh, which is responsible for, for handling all the offload interactions. And, and that, that is uh, the kernel BPF uh, offloaded C file. And then, uh, so if we look at the maps, there are really two paths inside this file. There is a separate map for creating and destruction of the maps, and there is a fast path for doing the uh, sort of fast path operations on the map. Uh, look up updates, deletes, etc. So the the create and, and destruction creation and destruction of the maps um, uh, is done for the networking subsystem uh, for the uh, network networking subsystem configuration paths. So it will go through the device the networking device driver operations, take all the networking device uh, logs, um, and that that is done to to ensure that the networking device is in a consistent state when the map creation or, or destruction is done. And that allows us to do sort of all sorts of checks and, and to make sure that the device is in a state where the map can be created. And also it, uh, it gives us the ability to, to protect from uh, concurrent operations on the device, which would put it in, 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 in a bad state. Um, so, so this is sort of a slow path and we don't expect users to, to perform those operations. And it is slow in the sense that it can only be done one at a time it's not it's not really slow uh, in terms of like walk look time um the, the the other path though is uh, the lookup and update path that's a fast path and there we don't go for the networking subsystem at all we have uh, direct calls to to the device driver uh, and those can be executed concurrently um we take a read a read a read side of a read write log um to make sure that the device is doesn't um so the, the, the reconfiguration paths will take the right side of the right side of the log, but the, all the uh, uh, memory the, or the map operations, which has to be uh, handled quickly, just take the read side and, and as I said, they can be uh, executed in parallel, and those go directly into the device driver outside of the networking subsystem, and uh, for all the operations that happen in the in the device driver, we will um, obviously uh, generate a, a some firmware interaction. And most generally for, for, for the map operations, we will uh, create a control message and send a control message to the firmware. And then the firmware um, uh, does the, the uh, modification of the device state uh, for us. Um, one important side note uh, is that the objects on the offload and the objects which are not offloaded can, cannot, um, cannot be mixed. Sir. So if we have a map that is created on the, on the kernel, it can only be accessed by the programs that are uh, on the host CPU. If we have a map that's uh, offloaded onto a device, it can only be accessed by the programs which are also offloaded on the device. And this is a, a, a requirement uh, we put in because uh, we don't want the users to be surprised by, by the performance degradation, which would be, uh, which would inevitably happen if the offloaded program starts accessing kernel memory. It's just the, the reality of the PCIe Express bus is such that 
it can't really be used for 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 fast uh, fast buff accesses like like accessing control state. So so we we um, keep a separation between the objects on the in the host CPU and the objects on the on the device, um, and uh, uh, and there is a possibility of of communicating obviously if one wants to create a, a advanced uh, sort of processing pipeline where some of the operations are done on the uh, on the device and some operations are that done on the kernel that's possible we have something called um, the, the kernel has something called uh, bpf metadata uh, and it allows users to attach metadata to a packet as it travels through the system so we can do some operations on the card um, perform map lookups perform some packet mangling and then attach a metadata with our results and then forward it to the kernel and the kernel doesn't have to repeat all this processing you can just look at the metadata uh, in front of the packet and and, and continue the processing that, that was not possible on the card or that we prefer to do in the kernel. Um, the access to both of the element the, of the objects that are in the kernel and, and in, the, uh, in the device is obviously the same from the user space perspective, but uh, from the kernel data buff perspective, the, the, the objects on the, on the device can be really accessed on the fast path. And, and the separation that we, we achieved by uh, we are setting the, the map operations appropriately. So uh, each map within the kernel has a, um, a number of callbacks associated with it. And these are for, for the control operations and, and for the, for the uh, fast path operations as well. And uh, what we do is when, the, when we have a map that is created on a device, an offloaded map, we will basically set, set all of those to, to a null to, to zero, so the, the kernel cannot invoke any operations in the fast path on a given map. And uh, as I said previously, the, the controls, the user space operations go through a, a system call path, So the, and the system call path will be redirected to the device, but the kernel side, kernel programs will not be able to, to access that, those maps. Um, um, oh, before, so this, this is basically this covers the, the map operations uh, and, and how map offload is handled. Now I will talk a little bit about the, how the program uh, program offload is handled. Um, something that uh, that uh, John already described in, in his uh, his presentation, uh, the, the the detailed presentation about the kernel verifier is that the verifier really does a lot of um, a lot of. Uh, verification and, and security checking, but at the end, it also does some of the common um, uh, code generation steps and sort of uh, compiler steps that all of the host uh, architectures require. So, so the verifier really grew as a, as a tool for verifying the programs, but it also with uh, over time has ac uh, acquired some, some common uh, operations for, for host, uh, host uh, BPF JITs. Uh, and if those actually are kind of um, counter counterproductive for us when we are doing offload. So um, when we're doing BPF program offload, we go through the verifier and this, all the security checks all the same as the program would go for 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 um, for being loaded into the kernel. But we actually exit the verifier uh, and uh, and um, jump over some of the the later parts where it, it is starting to basically do the, the host JITs. Um, and there's obviously a lot of um, uh, a lot of code that can be shared between the uh, between the host JITs. They all require um, replacing um, the map file descriptors with the actual pointers. They all require some form of um, uh, fu function inlining for performance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's, right, it's just slightly unfortunate that the all those steps in, in the kernel are done inside what is called the verifier, and, and we can we have to we have to skip them effectively for for offload. Um, so a similar slide is for the maps. Now we start on the left with the BPF system call for program loading. We go into the system call handling for the BPF subsystem, and the system call handling will um, will check whether the program is designated for offload or not based on the IF index field I mentioned. And if it is, uh, and if the program is, uh, is designated for offload, the BPF program offload init function will be run, and that function will associate the program with the device uh, to which it's supposed to be offloaded. It checks whether the device is actually offload capable, 
and then it will allocate uh, also the data structures which are later used for for tracking the association and the state of, of the offload um, and that actually uh, uh, doesn't involve uh, at the device driver yet the device driver is first invoked when we when we start the verification when the verifier first runs the the uh, verifier prepare function will will be called and uh, and the driver gets a chance to to allocate its state and, and its information about the program um, uh, before the verifier actually runs and this is done for the networking subsystem um, networking subsystem control uh, configuration path um, but once that uh, that step is uh, sort of finished there is a fast path for for communication between the verifier and the driver and uh, and uh, basically there is a hook inside the verifier that is called for every instruction that the verifier processes the verifier and again i'm referring to the uh, to the previous talk by john but for details but the verifier will uh, try to check the whether the program is safe to execute and and it will uh, walk all the execution paths of, of the of the uh, of the program and for every instruction that it checks it will call the the, the driver to perform it checks and to to do whatever operation it has to do and uh, we have two uses for the per instruction verifier callback first one is is verification so there are some constraints of the device or there might be features that are not implemented on the device and we have to basically then do our own verification of the program but we but we offer uh, we use all the verifier state and all the verifier um, logic that is already there in the kernel. We just make sure that the checks that the verifier um, that the device has to perform are done at the same time, and we also will um, output an error or warning messages into the same log that the verifier would. Um, a, a simple example of something that a hardware may require that that host CPU doesn't require, um, and this is also something that is required that just differs between different CPU architectures is um, accessing unaligned accesses to memory. Um, some CPU architectures require all the larger um, accesses to memory to be uh, to be word aligned or the, the access size aligned. Uh, and if the offload CPU or offloading CPU has that requirement and the kernel doesn't, the, the offloading driver has to make sure that that uh, that uh, the check is sort of performed. So, so there's a number of things that simple CPU architecture things that might be required and, and to be used is for instruction callback to, to make sure that the program will actually behave appropriately on the device. Um, and there is another uh, function of this callback where the verifier obviously gathers a lot of state, a lot, a lot of very interesting information about the program, about the program to, run it, to run its security checks and all this information is very useful for us for generating optimal code, basically. So we we will um, listen on the verifier callback and, and sort of take notes of the information and the context in which the instruction is run. And then if we see that the instruction is run only in a very specific way and with very constrained um, inputs and, and maybe constraint and, and the outputs are, are used in a very constrained manner, we can basically use a more efficient way of implementing some of the instructions. Um, or instructions and, and, and operations from memory access, etc. Um, and uh, once the verifier is done and all the all the instructions have been have been checked, the BPF uh, subsystem will move on to the sort of JIT and BPF core parts, and um, and it will invoke the BPF program offload translate functions if the program is uh, designated for offload. This is where the the difference between the host uh, host JITs and the the the, the, the offload JITs happen. If the if the pr program was designated for host CPUs, the kernel uh, BPF core will actually call the host JIT, and if it's an offloaded program, it will call the BPF prog offload translate function. And the prog offload translate function again invokes uh, for the networking configuration paths the the offload uh, BPF offload translate uh, operation on the on, on in the driver, and then the actual code generation, the machine code machine code generation will will happen inside the driver and the, uh, an image of, of the of the program for the device will be created and again once the once the program is uh, is no longer used obviously there is a uh, there is a program of destroy uh, 
function that is called, and then the driver can free all the resources, free all the stack that is associated with the program, and basically um, reduce the resources. Um, and uh, we're sort of prepared and, and ready in the device a memory, the, all the networking, all the user space APIs and all the networking APIs are used in the same exact manner as they would be for, for programs which, which are not offloaded. We support XDP offload, so the programs uh, which can, uh, which are of the type of BPF probe type XDP that are attached in, in the ingress, ingress of the device. And we also also support programs for CLS BPF um, uh, for offloading. Um, the programs, um, something uh, I think that's, that's not entirely clear, but that is worth mentioning. When we designate the program for offload for a device, we use, a, we use an identifier of a part of the device. So we will actually use a networking interface, uh, one of the networking interfaces. So there we have a networking card with two parts, with if zero and if one, for instance. We will, for instance, designate the, all, uh, all the programs for if zero, but the, there is actually there's only one ASIC in this case, if, if it's a two port card. So the programs, even though they are loaded for, for one of the ports, they can actually be attached to either of the ports and uh, we can save the memory on the card that way if we reuse the same program. So, so the, the, the designation of, of, the, of the networking the device on which we load the programs is really just to find a handle to, uh, to, the, to the ASIC. So any of the, of the ports can be used and then the programs and maps can be reused throughout the, the other ports of the same ASIC. Um, um, and that's basically all I wanted to cover today. I hope that that gives you a good um, understanding of, of the of the internals of the Linux kernel and how the BPF offload is implemented. I think the BPF um, virtual machine is very well suited for, for all sorts of heterogeneous processing. I'm personally uh, hoping that other subsystems, such as the storage subsystem, for instance, would uh, sort of go in a similar direction and and uh, and experiment uh, and, and create some some offload capabilities. The modern uh, modern um, ASICs are really really very programmable inside, so so creating a, a DPF sandbox should not be should not be a problem for for most um, advanced ASICs. Um, Obviously, the, the advantage of, of doing this all this stuff is is that we are saving host uh, host CPU cycles, and we are taking advantage of the specialized hardware that that is uh, that is just um, put into all the networking cards. Um, the the user space tuning remains unchanged, so the users shouldn't really uh, feel any pain from using this. This, this should be uh, should be a, a really simple change. And there is no APIs in the vendor SDKs. We are talking about something that's completely Linux kernel upstream, um, comes out of the box. Uh, there is no, 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 no vendor lock in here or no necessity to, to download special tools or deploy special applications to make use of, of the offload. Um, uh, and uh, with that, uh, I would like to invite you to, to check out our, our academic website. We have an open nfp.org website where where we interact with all sort of academics that are doing experiments. Feel free to, to reach out to us if you have any questions and, and to want to talk about your applications. Uh, Jennifer already mentions our, mentioned our forums uh, on help, help.natural.com. We also have a mailing list on, on Google Groups. And also, we obviously all, all the engineers at Natural who are working for BPF on BPF are, are subscribed to the networking mailing lists of, of the Linux kernel and the XDP newbies mailing list in particular as well. So if you have any questions regarding the offload or just BPF questions in general, we are always happy to help. Um, and with that, thank you for listening. Thanks, Kuba. So we have a couple of questions. The first question is, is payload stored in DRAM? Doesn't that limit forward rate? Um, so um, in the... Uh, I think the DRAM is, 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 is uh, that there is multiple DRAM channels and then it is obviously the, the performance of the DRAM is, is sized appropriately so that the, the line rate can be maintained with small packets. So I think there is no, not much concern there. And also that the DRAM has a, has a cache. So if, if we are talking about, uh, we are not doing any queuing on the chip actually, it's just a straight through the uh, forwarding. 
uh, and there is no like huge queue buildup on the inside the device itself, the the the, the packets would generally uh, mostly be present in the cache, and they will just be read out of the cache. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is: Can we do DPDK based packet processing in the host along with BPF offload in the Netronome smart NIC? Um, so we are we are thinking about that. It is not possible today. Um, one of the features that we are really excited about uh, and that has been added to the, the Linux kernel recently was the AFXDP socket type, and this allows uh, DPDK to run on on top of the Linux kernel without taking over the entire device. And then we can we would be uh, we would be able to basically use the all the kernel infrastructure for loading BPF and then run the DPDK app on top of um, on top of the AFXDP socket, uh, but uh, we don't have support in the DPDK driver for, for doing BPF offloads. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, if you could look in the QA box, Kuba. Um, let's see yes. Uh, so this use case multiple virtual functions, uh, one assigned to every VM, markable packet from every VM, send the markable packet. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so the question basically is is about um, forwarding forwarding packets and, and controlling the SRV function, SRV switch forwarding sort of uh, with BPF. And uh, it is not something that we have completed yet. We are working on that feature, but when it's completed, that would definitely something like this would be definitely possible. So basically, what we are looking at implementing is um, exposing all of them interfaces of the card, including the VMs, uh, uh, in, to the control plane of the, the Linux kernel. And then the users will be able to attach basically a BPF programs for, for, for packets, which are either arriving from the network or arriving from the VF or uh, even arriving from the host itself. And all the switching and all the packet modifications for all of those sort of ingress points to the ASICs will, will be done uh, using BPF. So, so yes. Um, we are hoping to get there. Great, thanks, Kuba. Now, if you could just pick a number between one and 85 for our winner of our Amazon gift card. Can I pick 83? 83 is Sridhar Kandaswamy. So I will be sending Sridhar uh, an email with his uh, Amazon gift card. And again, uh, you can find this information on uh, the EPP, EBPF offerings from Netronome at our website, netronome.com slash technology slash EBPF. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.